Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Black Women Diagnosed with HIV in the 80s, Where Are They Now webinar. I'm Destiny, the media strategist for Seeds of Healing. Seeds of Healing is an HIV awareness and advocacy organization whose mission is to deconstruct myths that perpetuate HIV stigma. We have taken an equity lens and worked to eliminate the health and well being disparities that persist among Black women living with HIV. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared on our SoTime platform, as well as posted to our YouTube channel. Attendees are able to drop questions in the chat box and they will be shared at the end of the webinar. Please feel free to ask questions and write comments throughout the entire program. There will also be a short survey at the end. So today's webinar is a SoTime event. SoTime is a virtual platform for Black women living positively. And here is a short video on so time. Hey, ladies, welcome to so time. My name is Benita Spradley, one of the moderators and content contributors here, and we're excited to have you aboard. Hello, Queens, and welcome to so time. I'm Tamisha Isaac, also one of your moderators and content contributors. I'm honored to have you join us. SoTime is a platform for Black women to connect across the U.S. to provide tools for self-care and encourage consistent adherence. SoTime is a platform for us created by us to collaborate and center issues that affects Black women, the struggle causes by a diagnosis or chronic illness. We have roots with specific topics to cater to the mission of SoTime, but uplift, empower, and strengthen you as we power through on this journey. Surrounding yourself with women that look like you in a safe space where you are free to be yourself while learning from each other and sharing resources that can enhance your way of life on the course of this journey. We are here for each one of you. We welcome you and we look forward to networking, supporting one another and learning new things as we come together on this so time website. Well, welcome. So a quick introduction to our panelists today. We have Pat Kelly. Patricia Kelly is a native New Yorker who resides in Orangeburg, South Carolina. At 67, she is aging gracefully and gratefully. She was diagnosed with HIV AIDS in 1985, 1998. She's founder and executive director of a family affair living our best life. HIV AIDS ministry at Victory Tabernacle in Orangeburg. She is a mother, grandmother, and great grandmother of eight. She's a member of various local and national HIV advocacy groups across the United States. And she has been honored by 2020 Leading Women's Society of Sister Love Inc. First Class of 2009. In September 2014, she received an honor from Positive Living Conference as the first Black woman to receive the Martin Delaney Power of the One. HIV AIDS Advocacy Award. As a common threader, she had the honor of being the first US group to make red ribbons for Levi Strauss World AIDS Day and under the micro enterprising of common threads had a booth at International AIDS Conference in Durban, South Africa in 2016. She has many affiliations, local, regional and national. Her personal model is I live to serve as I serve others, I serve myself. We have Lapina Reed who is a role model of universal hope and healing, diagnosed with HIV in the late 80s. She's demonstrating that you can overcome health challenges, improve your quality of life, become resilient, and thrive. Working with individuals, groups, and women at every stage in life to assist them in building confidence, accelerate the liberation of Black cisgender women's human rights, and create a fulfilling life. The founder of Ask is Survivor's Keys. She has the role of connector and her red ribbon earwear project does that by developing healthy conversations, increasing awareness and providing support to the HIV community. She's a certified trainer and educator in HIV awareness and prevention. She co-facilitates a national virtual support group for cisgender black women and collaborates with organizations in Florida and nationally a dedicated member of several advisory boards and an honorary member of the National Black Nurses Association in Tampa chapter, Lapina penned a collection of poems entitled Angel and Divine Service and recently had the honor of being featured in the 2021 issue of Pause Magazine, celebrating the accomplishments of Black advocates. 
And we have Ashley Daniels, our moderator, who is a Southeastern North Carolina native with a background as a community organizer in environmental justice, social, social justice, and grassroots electoral politics. She's the owner of Speak Life Consulting and works part-time at the LGBTQ Center of the Cape Fear Coast as the operations and programming assistant. Without further ado, I will turn it over to our lovely panel and I hope you all enjoy this program. Thank you, Destiny. Again, my name is Ashley Daniels. I'm really proud and excited to be here. Um, and just wanted to start with what we know about narratives. Um, sometimes if we hear a dominant narrative in the media, we might believe that that is the only narrative. Um, at the onset of HIV and AIDS, uh, the HIV and AIDS epidemic, um, the dominant narrative was that the only people impacted were gay white males. Um, this narrative, of course, disappeared the lived experience of entire demographics, especially the lived experiences of Black women. So I feel very honored and um, uh, deeply proud to be here today to uh, moderate this conversation between two Black women who are leading and thriving as survivors. Um, so I want to welcome you, Ms. Latina um, and Ms. Pat. Um, really happy to be here. I think the uh, approach that I'll take is to um, alternate uh, who I start questions with. So I will start the first question with you, uh, Ms. Pat, and I'll say, what was happening in your life during the 80s before you were diagnosed? Well, um, before I was diagnosed, I had returned back to college and I had made up my mind that I was going to go to law school, I had gotten an LSAT, was studying it. And then um, a situation happened and I ended up um, being incarcerated. And during my incarceration, that's when they um, tested me for HIV. And I came and I found out that I was diagnosed. The doctor diagnosed me and told me that I had AIDS, don't tell nobody, um, nobody was be associated with me. And, you know, it just during that time, there was no education, there was no support groups, there was just nothing. There wasn't even good medication that uh, could help you. And so it, it just turned my whole life around. It was like, I got an attitude of hopelessness, um, knew that I, I felt because people told me that I wasn't gonna live long, that I was going to die. And everything that I had hoped to do just was out of my reach at that time. Yeah, thank you for sharing and really glad that you're here today, um, despite all those things that people told you. Uh, what about you, Lafina? What was happening in your life during the 80s uh, before you were diagnosed? Thank you, Ashley. And I wanna thank, um, Seas of Healing for inviting me here today. So in the 80s, I mean, I was about 32 or so in uh, 1988. And that was a disco, that was a disco time for me. Disco music was live and living. And um, some of my favorite artists, of course, was Donna Summers, Patti LaBelle, Whitney Houston. But um, now thinking at that time and going forward as we continue this conversation, um, there was Gloria Gaynor, I Will Survive. But then there was this other song, which uh, I don't know really any of the other lyrics except staying alive, staying alive, staying alive. You know, I came from a movie and everything like that. So I, I danced to it then and it's fallen in my life, you know, ever since those words, because that is exactly where I am almost 34 years since I was diagnosed with the human immunodeficiency virus. But um, I love to travel and besides just, you know, dancing, which I continue to do, um, traveling for me was, was like jumping on a plane, was like jumping on a bus or going across town. Because I had gotten that advice from someone at one time to go see other places, go see other people, because that way you will learn far, far more things than you will just staying in one place. So I took their advice. I was traveling um, 
and also the work that I was doing, then I was in uh, production stylist for film, print and set. So that's really was my um, occupation at that time. And, and I freelance, so they gave me the opportunity to be able to travel like that. And uh, that was really the 80s for me at that time before uh, my diagnosis. When I did, when, when that came right off, um, I started, um, I started uh, giving support to the community, just like Pat said, uh, it wasn't really for black women. Uh, we thought that for sure, all you heard in the news was, you know, gay men, but needless to say, I had friends and family who were affected with that. So I began um, doing red ribbons just so they would support respite homes and it would bring food and monies, you know, because uh, it was needed at that time. And oddly enough, I'm gonna hold one up just in trying to throw out some of my memories and things that I was going over the past, I found one of the some of the one of the original ribbons and stuff that, uh, and I don't know if holding it up, you know, and and even the cord of it is really rusty and old at this point. But that was, you know, just one of those ribbons. And as I even hold this up now, those those times and everything really set strong for me. So, yeah, that's the eighties. Thank you. Uh, the second question that I'll ask, can you remember when the news dropped about the signs and symptoms that we now know to be HIV and AIDS? And at that time, what were your thoughts about what you were hearing? Um, and I'll start with you, Athena. Well, you know, like I had, you know, just finished saying it, it, it there, there weren't women really named in, in the, equation at all. It was known as when it did get a name, um, gay, um, related. gay related um, immune deficiency grid. And, and so I, I know lots of women and lots of people really felt in that this is you, this just affects one population and community of life, but it didn't. And uh, and we, we found that out as, as, I mean, I found that out personally for myself, but we found that out as time goes on, that just as uh, women now, and especially black women, aren't recognized and put in the equation, that still stands for today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pat, I will ask you the same question. Can you remember when the news dropped about these signs and symptoms that we now know to be HIV and AIDS? And what were your thoughts at that time? And I think that we might have uh, lost her for just a moment. Well, and I can even go on, you know, with other, um, because as you know, and many times people still might not remember the history or weren't born to know the history, but there were um, there were messages from science and medicine that said that there would definitely be a vaccine for this virus in the next two years, which seemingly this was, you know, the 80s and that vaccine hasn't come to point yet. And, uh, you know, that is something that's really disappointing. We look at we look right now at COVID and the COVID, even some of the um, applications of from HIV um, cells and all were used in COVID-19 and SARS. And so when are our vaccines coming? You know, when, when so many times now it's, uh, people are saying that HIV is lost and forgotten. They're not hearing about it anymore. And so as I uh, think about some of those signs and symptoms, you know, 40 years ago, uh, we haven't even matched that to this point in 2022. But then we began to hear, there wasn't really even uh, when, when Magic Johnson, you know, when they spoke of Magic Johnson, when he came out, that's when even for the black population, did you begin to hear anything? But again, women weren't included in that. Yeah. So um, to continue on that point about what you were saying, when, uh, when you first heard from like the scientific community, it was still being, like there was a narrative that this only impacts the certain demographic of, of gay males. Um, how long after that initial announcement of 
HIV um, that came out like through the scientific community, came out through the media. How long after that announcement were you diagnosed and how did you come to find out? Well, the year was 1988 for me. I, I, I only imagine just like these ribbons that I found, you know, some things and then remember now my age is, you know, I'm going through my uh, 60th chapter of life. So um, a friend said that they were going to the Red Cross, they were going to go get tested, they were dating someone and they thought that um, she maybe made that suggestion because um, heavy um, works were coming out of the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. And I think at one point people even had to carry cards that showed that they had a negative test. And uh, so he, they were seeing someone and they said, go with me down, you know, I'm gonna go test. So uh, when they, I went with them, I decided that I would just go ahead and test also since I was there. And during those times, it wasn't, you know, a rapid test. It they, was a blood draw and you for two weeks, you had to wait until you, um, would get your return diagnosis and you had to go back into, they, they didn't, you know, take your names or anything. You were just a long number or reference. So when I went back, um, the, the person that I went with, I think theirs went fine and they came out looking, you know, sort of, oh, well, okay. And then I went in and I remember, you know, the, um, the, the young man that was there to, you know, to give me the results and all, he, he just, he was so nervous. He was so shake, shaken and everything. So it came to that he said, your test is showing that you're, they, it came back positive. And you know, he began to cry, you know, as he looked there. And so he's like, I, you know, I don't know. I don't really know that I believe this. Uh, maybe you want to test again. There's something known as false positive, which false positive is just sort of a coding that um, they do. And and I was like, well, it's been two weeks already. You know, I don't really, uh, I'm not really going to go through that again at this time. But I use that reference, you know, that he became so shaken by the whole thing and to say, you know, you don't, it, this doesn't look like this affects you. You don't look like it. And that's been a bit of my story. And I will continue to share that as we talk that um, there's at that point in time in the eighties, yeah, there was certainly a look to if it was an uh, acquired immune deficiency diagnosis of AIDS, but um, all the time you don't walk with those letters on your forehead to look like that. So that is how I learned of my, um, you know, my diagnosis and, and that is, um, that's what I did in the first place. So I let it go for a couple of years since I wasn't going to go back and test at that time. That two, year, that two week um, period really is straining and emotional. And, uh, and so in 1992, I went back again to a new sort of clinic that had opened up. And I thought, okay, let's uh, go through this again. And when I walked in, well, there were women. There were um, women in this new uh, center that had opened up, but it was so, so, so sad and depressing. I mean, you know, I, I still, I, you know, when you talk about these things, you go back and reflect into them. And it was a room full of uh, black women and they were holding babies and crying. It was emotional. It was sad. It was painful. And uh, I just said, no, no, that song came back to me again. Maybe not at that point, but I'm going to stay alive. I'm, I am going to stay alive. I don't know how, and some way I am going to help other women with this too. So um, my, my levels were, they had gone a little less, but it wasn't really at the point of medications. And uh, 
I just felt that women don't deserve this pain. And, and that's what I did with it for a little bit. And I know we're going to talk more and Pat seems to be backing. So, yeah. Thank you. Pat, welcome back. Um, I will ask you the same question. Um, can you remember uh, how long after the initial announcement of the symptoms of HIV and AIDS that you might've heard through the media and heard through science, how, how long after that were you diagnosed yourself and how did you come to find out? Um, I've never had any signs or symptoms of the illness of HIV. And if I had not been tested without my knowledge, I don't know when I would have been tested and when I would have found out. I mean, because I never had any of the symptoms, so I would have never had any reason to go to be tested because as Lapina said, it, it didn't affect me. It was a white gay man's disease. And so why would I even think that I fit in a category of contracting this disease, you know? And so I watched it on the news um, because during that time, my lifestyle, I took some precautions. And when I was told initially, I didn't believe it. I went to be retested um, and I was. Um, I always felt as though the medications that they were giving us at that time, uh, they were using us as guinea pigs. So I refused to take the medicine for many, many, many years. I was diagnosed in 1985. I didn't start taking meds until 1994. And um, the only reason I started then was because my T cells had gone down to such a low level. And, you know, I had some therapy and counseling. They said, if I wanted to live because the um, stages, you know, they told me about now I was living with AIDS and to be re-diagnosed was just like the first time all over again. I was re-traumatized so many years later, almost 10 years later after the first diagnosis. And so I really wasn't in care for about 10 years. I did therapy. You know, I didn't have any signs or symptoms of the disease itself, but I was emotionally drained and really at a very bad place that had no place for the medicine. You know, what was going on in my head was far worse than anything that they could say in the media. Um, and it took me a while, you know, through therapy to be able to accept who I am. And before therapy, it was a support group that helped me to accept my diagnosis and believe that I could live again. Because during that time, it was nothing but death. If you went to the clinic um, at that particular time, I was in South Carolina and they had a night clinic. And the clinic was like at six o'clock in the evening. So if you want to find out who was living with HIV, all you had to do was ride by the clinic. And you see people going in and out. And you knew that that was the time for the clinic. And people looked like death. Yeah, you know, they were really not identifiable as who they were before they contracted this disease. So for the signs and symptoms, you know, I listened to a lot of news which um, we all know that uh, false news, you know, as science has evolved. I remember when they said that if you were a person diagnosed with HIV, your life expectancy was 10 years because uh, within 10 years, you would have AIDS and you would die. Well, here I am 38 years later. And obviously that science was totally false. They also said that uh, if you were in a relationship with somebody that was living with HIV, you had to um, protect yourself if that was your partner, that you would reinfect each other. And we also know now, you equals you, that, you know, if you take your medicine and do things you need to do to continue to keep yourself healthy, 
you can't transmit this disease to anyone else. So as science evolved, education evolved, and we became more knowledgeable about things and listening to false news really had an emotional effect on me. So um, I had to learn to reinvent myself, to be who I was with a diagnosis. But all the news and media did was really scare me. It scared the bejesus out of me, you know? It scared me to the point that I couldn't touch nobody, you know, because of the ignorance. But then I finally, after about nine years of being that, I was like, okay, wait a minute, I'm still here. Okay, uh, I didn't hit the 10 year mark, I'm still here. Now it's time for me to live my life instead of thinking about dying. And if I'm gonna live, I'm gonna help another sister live also. And that's what I've been trying to do because that uh, false news um, really, really emotionally has a stuck in stigma right now. So many people are stigmatized internally that they can't begin to accept um, this diagnosis. And with that being a problem for them individually, it continues to perpetuate the stigma. Thank you. Um, I think you both have touched on this um, at, at different points in some of your responses, but uh, Pat, I know that you're talking about when you were first diagnosed, um, the way that the doctor came and told you and like advised you to like not tell anyone. Um, and I know that that's some of the ways that people have found out information have changed behaviors over time. So uh, the question that I would like to ask, what was it like back then to have a positive diagnosis, right? Both from like medical staff, from family, from friends. Um, and also what did doctor's appointments look like at that time? Um, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, um, I'll just continue on uh, with that comment. And as uh, Pat had, had said um, when I what I was just sharing with those women in the you know in the clinic in the waiting room looking in despair and pain and hurt but with that examination and and that day in the clinic they told me that I had fibroids and that these needed to be removed so made the appointment, went to the hospital to get it done. And seemingly many of the women, if not all of the women that were in that same room that day with me in that clinic, they were all there at the hospital to, um, to get uh, probably the same procedure of uh, fibroids. And fibroids, they say, are common in Black women. But I look at, you know, um, the MSH as it is now, molecular HIV surveillance and data collecting without um, our consent and the security that we could be, I apologize for that, and the security that we could, um, our information could go public, which could cause um, HIV criminalization. So it almost put us in a place of feeling like, for me, of the Tuskegee experience, experiments and all because all of us were in this clinic and then all many of the women, if not all of them, it still looked like the same packed room, like the clinic that we all had this appointment to go to the hospital and get fibroids. So they possibly at that point, there could have been other testing and things that were going on that they didn't make up us aware of at all. So as much as I believe in um, clinical trials and research, and I want that for women, I don't want um, these surveillance testings to uh, cause any more triggers and traumas and criminalize people. So that's on the page right now. Back then there were, there were lack of services, case managers, and like Pat said, the amount of medications, you know, it was, 30 or more a day, I couldn't see myself doing that. I just could not see myself, you know, taking all that medication. So I had a pushback, just as Pat said, for about 15 years before I went into the hospital and 
re-traumatized again with a um, diagnosis of acquired immune deficiency with a CD count of less than eight or so. So it was at that time, and this was after 1996, this was the early 2000s, that um, I decided to begin treatment and uh, and, and that's how it, you know, that's how it worked out for me. But the doctors that I had at that point in time were really very good. They were um, listening, compassionate, and uh, they really, you know, they really cared. And so I have to say, if that had been my story some 15 years earlier, and if all of those things were in place, I, I never did at that point did any therapy or anything like that. There were no support groups that I knew about. So I just continued, you know, to live. Like I said, I'm going to stay alive. I just continued to live and, and, and try to uh, do the best that I can. Um, I always was conscious about, you know, my health and what I did and put into my body and how, you know, I ate and I exercise and I still do that to this day. But um, self-care for me is health care. So um, what, what they were really telling me at that point wasn't enough. So um, the medications are better now and, and all of those things. So I started. And uh, I just say that with the doctors, now you really have to be regiment with them. I have a good doctor. But things that are happening at this point, they want you only to have a 12 to, 12 to 15 minute appointment. You have to have all of your um, talking points and places in order because if you're not being authentic and, and doing your homework about your health, if you're waiting for a doctor to do it, that's not gonna happen. Thank you. Uh, Pat, I'll ask you the same question. Um, what was it like back then to have a positive diagnosis, both from family, friends, social groups, as well as um, doctor's appointments and what that treatment looked like? It was scary. It was traumatizing. It was debilitating um, as far as trying to live your life. Um, you were put in a bubble, you know, um, you were set aside from the other people because the stigma was truly, truly real. And living in the city, it wasn't as bad as it was when I moved to the South. Um, I was diagnosed in the South and I had to leave because I could not go to a clinic once a week and see people here this week and here they died the next week, you know? And that itself was traumatizing. The way we were cared for um, was really traumatizing. You know, you had doctors that didn't want to touch you, but they were there seeing you, you know? You had uh, individuals um, telling your business to people, you know, before you were ready to tell people or even accept it yourself, um, you know, it was just a crazy, crazy time. And a lot of that has spilled over and it's still going on today, you know, depending on where you're at, where you live in this country. Um, I do know that the support I received in the North, in New Haven, Connecticut, was a lot better than what I received in the South. Um, and because of that, I left the South and I didn't leave physically, but I left the medical care in the South. Go back to New Haven, Connecticut, Nathan Smith Clinic, to the doctors that really informed me in the beginning. You know, I just refused to take meds. There was no way I was going to take 30 or 40 pills a day. Yo, man, I'd rather die than <laughs> trying to stuff that stuff down my throat. And so I didn't take medicine for a long time. And my initial doctor that I had when I was first diagnosed, uh, 
who was my doctor at Nathan Smith, still works there. And although he's not my doctor anymore, because I would come in and leave and go away and don't come back. And then I'll come back and, you know, I was sporadic with my care. I did not do the things that I needed to do to continue to keep myself healthy. So I know that I am a walking, talking miracle and God is still alive because here I am 38 years later, about to be 39, and I am still alive, thriving, and living my best life. You know, at 67, about to be 68. And if I had allowed um, the rumors, the myths, and all of that stuff to take a hole inside of me, I wouldn't be here today. I really, really, really believe that my life, I would have shortened my life with somebody else's beliefs and myths and falsehoods. Um, because I serve a living God who loves me regardless of when I know how to take care of myself or do the things that I need to do. I'm still here for the purpose of trying to help somebody else. Um, I truly, truly do know that the emotional um, trauma that I went through during that time, everybody needs to have a therapist, <laughs> you know, or a support group or someone to help you through where your mind will take you in your dark days. I, you know, and I still have some of them sometimes, you know. Um, yeah, in the early days, not having the support really hastened a lot of people's death, I do believe, because if they had been spiritually, emotionally, and physically supported, they would still be here, you know, but because we gave up on them, they gave up on themselves. And I'm telling you, uh, the best news that could happen is that me and Latina are here as witnesses to let everybody know this is not a death sentence. Mm -hmm. We are here thriving, surviving, and doing all that we can to live our best life. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that good word. We appreciate it. Um, all right. So you're, come back. you're asking me what some of the myths were or? And the concepts did I? Oh, no, we, we didn't get to that one yet. Oh, um, oh, okay. I actually think because of time, we might, um, we might just talk about what you all are doing right now. Um, and I also want to watch, uh, want to remind folks who are watching that um, you can feel free to drop questions in the chat box. Um, we will, before we end, before we wrap up, we will uh, ask questions that, that folks have. Um, but yeah, I think that I wanna ask you all about today. So, you know, you, you shared about some of, the, um, some of the challenges, some of the misconceptions about who looks like they have HIV, um, about like the need for like support and support groups. Um, but I am curious to know specifically, um, how did you become an advocate and what prompted you to do so? And Lakina, we'll start with you. Oh, okay, thank you. But if I can go back just one minute, because I wanted to make a point about that for women. Um, what was said about women is women don't get AIDS, they just die. Mm. I mean, that was really a slogan. It's a book that, you know, was published. So that is not true because as Pat said, we're here under all of those circumstances where women weren't recognized and put in the equation. We're here, Pat and I are here and there are other many um, trailblazers that uh, are right along there with us. So women do not die. They get ready and they take action. So now uh, when you ask me about, about what kind of actions we're doing, um, the uh, just one more point I want to make about um, just do related to COVID because in 2022, we're hearing from young women that, or women who are recently diagnosed and with COVID being a part of the, 
uh, health conditions right now. Many of them think that those symptoms of a fever, a headache, a cold, diarrhea, all of these things are some of the symptoms that first begin you know, with um, HIV. They have come and, and shared that that's what they thought it was. They thought that this was probably COVID, you know, not um, HIV. So far more and most important to this day is to test, to ask your doctors to test you, to um, demand that you want to be tested. If they ask you, why do you, you know, why are you asking me about this? I know there was one um, office, my, one of my primaries, I asked him one time about condoms and though he got shocked, like, no, we don't have condoms. And I'm like, well, that's, you know, that's not an unquestionable thing to ask because um, people, are having um, intimate relations and people do need to know uh, that condoms are available besides just purchasing them. So I just wanted to push that piece in because even today people and with COVID, they think some of the symptoms are related to that, but those are some of the beginning symptoms of the virus. So testing is so important. So those are some of the reasons why I want, I advocate because when I heard less than one month, two months ago from women that who are just recently diagnosed that I wasn't hearing about HIV anymore. I mean, we're out here on the forefront all the time. That's what I feel. That's where Pat is. That's where I am. That's where sisters are. And when we hear this, that they're not hearing anything and still don't know where to go find services or how to reach out. Some of them, it's been social media and they were able to reach out. And what did we do as women in the movement? We joined on calls and we will speak to those women immediately. And we will try to give them information and lead them into services that they need to do. So that is what is happening going forward these days that we are building a um, empire of cisgender Black women because we know that who is coming for us is us. We have to do it for ourselves at this point. So that was my reason. That is my reason. That is where I am in advocacy that I am staying with it and we are fighting for the lives of Black women. We are fighting for the lives of Black women because it is crucial at this point in our politics and in our medicine that we are there for each other. Thank you. Uh, Pat, I'll ask you the same question. How did you become an advocate and what prompted you to do so? I became an advocate because of a fabulous, wonderful lady named Miss Elsie Cofield, uh, who started AIDS Interfaith in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, she showed me that love, you know, would conquer. And she actually gave me my life to love. You know, she was, she amplified Jesus. And in this day, from the love that she has shown from all that I had heard, the myths and everything like that, she just loved on each and every one of us. She took us to the state house in New ha in Connecticut, uh, to Harford. When people died, she was there to help bury them. And she just showed so much support and love when you thought you were hopeless. You know, and it was because of her that I am who I am now, aside from all the other people that God had placed in my life to give me direction. And because of that, I am now running an agency in rural South Carolina to help support women, to show them that they are loved, that they are and should be living their best life. They are um, supported. Um, through the ministry at my church, Victory Tabernacle, my bishop, Bishop Michael C. Butler, allowed us to start a support group. And from that support group, we have grown to be so much more. So right now, our agency of family affair 
living our best life is serving Black women living with HIV, something very different in the rural South. And we are meeple driven. Um, we're doing it for ourselves because nobody's coming to save us. Nobody's coming to help us. And the big agencies that get the money, they are more about pushing for staff and paying staff instead of uh, helping us to get our needs met. And one of the needs that we have, we're more than a pill. You know, a lot of times they think push, push, push medicine. You know, why would I take medicine if I don't have no place to lay my head? Why would I take medicine if I have to walk around lying and hiding about my disease because nobody's going to want to associate with me? I have hopelessness and there's nobody to help lift me up. I thank God so much for Ms. Cofield because she gave me a hand up. You know, she reached, she lifted her hand and she just amplified Jesus. You know, she just amplified that love and through her and the things that she did to help bring me back to life. That's my desire to help black women in the rural South begin to live and not feel that internal stigma that directs their life. You know, that trauma really, really, really puts you in a place that sometimes you want to take your own life because you're in so much pain from thinking your mind that took you to a place where nobody else can take you. And try to pull them up out of that because I've been there, you know, and um, I just want to be able to show them there's a different way. And so we've been lucky enough to be funded to do a lot of things in the South right now. Um, we have a group that we have on Mondays, first Mondays called Affirmation Mondays. Um, we're working with a group of women in North Carolina, South Carolina, hoping to expand so, I mean, we're working with women in South Carolina and Georgia, hoping to expand to North Carolina, but all rural women, you know, because in the rural South, we go to the doctor, like uh, Lapino said, that 15 minutes, no. You are you going to give me more than 15 minutes because I have some issues that I need to discuss. And if I can't discuss them with you as my doctor, then I need to be finding another you know, doctor because uh, I want to live. You know, you're not going to tell me something that don't allow me to question it or you don't go do your homework to help me to live my best life, you know? And so the work I do empowers me, like my motto, you know, we are who we serve. Uh, right now we are expanding so much that we're looking for new staff, <laughs> you know? We need volunteers, we need staff to do the work that we're doing in the rural South, you know, because we can't wait for nobody to do this for us. We have to do it for ourselves. If we wait for others to do it, <laughs> we'll be hanging on by, you know, a thread. And that's what's been happening. That's why a lot of women in the South in 20, 30 years, they haven't even shared their diagnosis with anybody. So can you imagine what's that like to hide and to have that secret all these years? Because trust, number one, you don't know who to trust. You don't want to tell and share this information and somebody go out there and spread it all over the place. But after living 10 years and I'm still here, all that stuff they said, I was like, you know what? <laughs> false, false, false. And I'm going to prove them, <laughs> you know, and all those things. It's false because I'm still here as living proof for the miracle that God is still working miracles. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. You know, and okay. you just got to want to live your best life. And it takes a lot, you know, we need, we need therapy. We need a loving hand to help pull us up, you know, and um, we just got to start to believe in ourselves as black women, you know, we can do this thing. All we need to do is come together. And one of the things that we um, do is every second Saturday, we have a black space and it's not necessarily people live with HIV, but it's time to deal with this racism and white supremacy, because that's another thing that has held us down internally and not allowed us to thrive, you know? So I just try to do whatever the women feel that they want or need. Um, looking forward to the coming year. We're hoping to send women to different conferences and trainings so that they can broaden their horizons and understand that the rural South 
It's just here and there are other people, other places doing other things to help and teach and help us to grow and to become more wiser. And I am tired of being an afterthought as a woman where this is a man-centered world. As we can see, men and, <laughs> you know, what they think we need as women, um, we have to prove them wrong. You know, we just have to stand up for ourselves because if we don't, we won't be here. Thank you. I really appreciate this time and this opportunity to really share. And um, just give thanks to all those that um, have empowered me, you know. And it's been a lot of folks, a lot, a lot, a lot of folks. Yeah, um, Pat, I want to say uh, the same thing. And and for me, it's really something to get up. I'm, every day I get up, I'm fatigued. I'm tired. If, if I didn't have to, I would lay in bed, but then I can't lay in bed because I need to get up. So, but the fatigue is there, but still I get up every morning. I start with my affirmations. Uh, I go out, I make sure that I physically get my mind and body together. I walk in the morning. I try to, when possible, get through in the evening too, or at least do some kind of stretching movement sort of things. That's a um, activity that I do with women that I have been doing for the past 10 years. I do it at conferences. I now do it locally with centers and I, you know, I do it, um, with groups, just um, initial, how do you get moving? How do you move your body? Because it's important. These medications are toxic. And for Pat and I to say that we didn't start begin taking them for some time, but I'm already 20 years into the time that I've taken them. And so I plan on living 20, 30 years from now. And what will these medications do to our bodies? They are going to break them down along with the other co comorbidities that come along with aging. And all of the uh, young women are finding themselves with heart conditions in their early 30s. So I look for research. Uh, you know, I want to really start a petition. I have been going on this for the past uh, couple of years. I want to start a petition that we let the uh, scientists and med medical community know these medications are putting excess weight on us. And that's why I have to exercise all the time, change my diet. Of course, you know, as you age, you need to change your diet anyway. But um, I put on 30 pounds. That wasn't a cause of me. I love cake. I wasn't eating cake that much. So, you know, I don't know. It was happening. But I have at this point reduced um, 25 of those pounds, but it's not easy to do. And then uh, with the comorbidities besides diabetes and uh, fractures and all of these symptoms that are coming down the line as we age. And, and we are beginning to have to be co-care takers for other people in our family our partners, our husbands, our grandchildren, uh, other family members and other friends. So this is a, a heavy um, responsibility that we have as we're aging. So, and because we didn't think or people didn't think that we would live beyond six months, two years, longest 10 years, many people did not um, set in place how they were gonna age how where they were going to live if they had any money if they were going to be isolated and we know with COVID in itself isolation can be a factor too for stress and for um feeling lost and um no hope so as we age with this these are other things that we have to um bring attention to because it's real we're aging and uh, these things have not been set up. We're the first generation of this virus. So we have to build these places and opportunities for us ourselves. We have to set up these things because they weren't put in place for us to even live this long. Um, my faith has been my guiding light. It is my guiding light. Um, 
that's the reason I know that I'm here too. We're here to continue to do the work. And uh, I have so, so many women, you know, to thank because as I said that my doctors were good, well, the doctors ran down, you know, my blood work and they told me other things like this, but you have to stay on top of these things yourself. You have to begin to know your records. Your yes. health care is your care. You have yes. to care and take care of yourself first. So when you go into an appointment, make sure that you're there and ready, like they're on their laptop, you're on your laptop, or you have your papers and you go back and forth with them. Because that's why I had to leave. And that's where I met that woman that I'm pointing to right now, Pat Kelly, and others, <laughs> because we were there learning more. I had to move from out of the community that I was in and take it to a national level so that I could meet and see and recognize that I'm not alone because that feeling of loneliness and it's only me and I don't, nobody's really telling me that um, if I were a young woman now that if I was having a baby that I am able to chest or breastfeed. I mean, black women aren't being told this information. PrEP is available, but black women still aren't being, it's not shown in advertisement. It's not, um, it's not offered in many locations. It's not even talked about a PrEP and PrEP is um, a medication that if you take it, um, you're, it, um, what am I trying to say there, Pat? It um... You can take PrEP, right? Um, it's a medication that will help you not to contract HIV if you're in a relationship with somebody else that's positive. That's positive. Or if you are living your life and you just want to secure yourself, some would like birth control pills mm -hmm. uh, that were uh, early on in our day. So, but these, 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 this information isn't given by many um, medical um, practices to women still to this day. So I met, I, be, I started with a support group and one of the ones was a local one and there um, those local women just, um, just motivated me to go to reach further. And so organizations like Seeds of Healing, Positive Women's Network, uh, Common Threads, um, ICWNA, they're out there, look them up, get in touch. These women will connect with you and talk to you. And that's the reason that I have stayed with a support group for five years as a co-facilitator because it's needed. Everyone needs someone to talk to. Everyone needs to hear that they're not alone with it. And those are what support groups do. At one point, uh, Support groups did, did were thriving, but now they are they have disappeared, and so um, they're so so necessary in all communities. Pat, we're just talking all over the place like we do, Ashley. Um, if you have questions, we'll stop so you can say something. Do we want to get it out? This is what we want to do. We want to speak to the community and let them hear this information. Mm -hmm. And we need to let the communities know that we need them. You know, you don't have to be a person with HIV that can show love and help us thrive and move forward. We just need you to be there to understand and know that even though I'm living with this chronic disease and some states will lock me up if I don't disclose my status, you know, that if I feel worthy, I can move forward. And it's the community. You know, back in the day, it was we we were a village and we raised our kids and we did what we need to do. We got to go back there if we want to start to thrive because racism and white supremacy has held us down long enough. Absolutely. I hope y'all are seeing all the love that you're getting in the chat with um, people uh, congratulating you for needing new staff, people um, thanking you for sharing your story. And I did want to lift up something that you said, Lapina, about um, planning for the future. Um, I don't know the, the numbers on it, but there are always these studies about how the average American is not prepared for retirement. And the average mm -hmm. American does not average have American. adequate savings for, you know, when they get older in life and when they can't bring in a sustainable income. Um, 
and then how that might be doubled or impacted if you're also um, living with a diagnosis that you don't want to disclose, you don't feel safe or comfortable to disclose. So um, thank you just for looking up the significance of that as well. And, and I want to yeah. say, when you talk about planning for the future, we um, do a three-day um, program. It's called Raising Our Awareness and Representation for Black Women Living with HIV Over 50. And we look at who's going to take care of us when we can't take care of ourselves no more. We're not in a society where our kids are going to be there like I was for my mother and my father, you know. And we have to make these plans to prepare to live, you know, and thrive as we age because all oh, so many years of medication is going to have us going through things that scientists have never even thought about. And we need to be able to know that we can thrive as we age. So. Thank you. Um, the next question that I will ask, uh, if you could share maybe one or two of either your most significant significant accomplishments as an advocate or your proudest moments as an advocate. Um, and Pat, we can start with you. Well, one of my most significant things is to be able to um, have a Memorial, we have a red ribbon in the back of the church. And once a year, we celebrate those that we've lost in our community and who have been associated with us. And to have that in the community come together to help us raise money to put that red ribbon in the back of the church and do this uh, yearly event. We just had it in June and it went live. And, um, you know, we got to celebrate those that we have lost and we have to celebrate those that are still living. We got to celebrate, you know, because we're still here and we're here for a purpose and we need to love on one another and let everybody know that this chronic disease is not going to take us out. It's going to be something else that recently I lost two friends and neither one of them died from complications of AIDS. They both died from cancer, <laughs> you know, and um, to see the difference in what is taking us out these days rather than the way it was because of the medication. So. Uh, the Serenity Garden is a place that is very dear to my heart. You know, another accomplishment is to start a family of fair living our best life. To have an organization in the rural South supporting Black women in the rural South who so many times get left behind. You know, the city could be 20 miles away. And the things they're doing in the city you'll never learn about because you're in the rural South. You ain't got no transportation to go, you know and be a part of. And so one of the things we're doing right now for rural and since COVID, we have been able to be sponsored by um, the Sparks program to be able to help women living in rural areas by giving them Wi-Fi extenders, helping them pay a Wi-Fi bill or giving them tablets so that we can stay connected. You know, so that is another accomplishment that I'm very proud of. And I'll tell you my proudest, proudest moment is to be able to have an organization with dedicated staff who are just like the women we serve. We are who we serve. So, you know, the background and everything, we really, really, as women living with HIV, move forward in doing the things that we need because nobody else is going to know what I need except for me. You know, the medical um, community and the community, they think they know and they're going to tell me this or tell me that and put that out there for me but they never came to me and asked me you know so how you going to serve me and leave me on the side of the table and don't invite me to come in and have supper with you you know so that's another one all right thank you so much I want to thank all of you that have left the messages in the chat and I just want you to know that even you uh, by saying what you're saying tonight is uplifting me, you know, and bringing joy and helping me to do the work that I do. And it helps me be inspired. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And I, I want to remind folks, um, if you have a question uh, for either of our panelists, please feel free to leave it in the chat and we'll, we'll get to it. Um, uh, Lupina, I'll ask you the same question. If there are one or two things that you would list as like um, your most significant accomplishments or things that you felt the proudest of? 
again, I go back to staying alive. That is just my greatest accomplishment. <laughs> And I tell you, when I started this evening, you know, uh, everyone that's out there, I sort of shared with everyone that there gets to be a point and at my time of the day that I just laugh or I get the giggles or something. And, and laughter has been a huge healing factor for me. Laughter is a full releasement of any sort of pressures and things that you might be feeling i use that as a healing source in a big way and and i use it still today so staying alive and then being able to have the support of my family the support of super warrior sisters like pat kelly right there <laughs> She is energy beyond. She just moves and shakes. So, and to know the many, many, many other women that are out there, you know, uh, if I begin to, you know, like an award, if I begin to speak everybody's name, it would go on and on and on. I never knew that I could meet a thousand women who were living life like I was. 2,000, it might be 10,000 women now. You know, and uh, we all uh, have the same, uh, you know, we come with where we've had the hopelessness or, or feelings of not desired or wanting to give up, but we don't. So it was really one real accomplishment for me because I knew what, I felt his pain. And I knew what he was going through as a young boy and being hated and discriminated and uh, stigmatized and all was Ryan White. And when I got to meet his mother, um, Jenny, um, that was just, that was really a moment and a time for me because as a mother too, I felt her pain before when we, when I knew the story and I felt the pain that she, you know, had to have, but for someone like this, those services that mark his name, Ryan White services have helped, helped, helped so, so many um, in the community. So that was one thrilling accomplishment to um, when you meet people face to face. And Pat, I remember uh, one time when we were in Washington and we were just in a hallway by ourselves and there was a family of Elizabeth Taylor. And that was impactful too, because you, your spirit runs through the spirit of others and, and what they have put out and what, they're, what they gave and, and what they believe so. And then to each, to every, every uh, sister that um, have come across and come into my life, that's a big accomplishment. And I talked about the, I, I write a little, I write and I have written um, several, pub and I have several writings and I have um published in others writing so those are accomplishments for me because I started with I do affirmations every morning too and um, affirmations get me going and I know there was one sister at one time that said Lapina gets these little pieces of paper and she gives them to people and people just enjoy them so much and so as much as I enjoy giving them to them um, every I enjoy but myself receiving them and having them uh, and using them, they're all over the place for me that I use affirmations, which help to build me, support me, and uh, give me a strength as I read them. And then, uh, as I said earlier, I started with the red ribbons, you know, and, and I and I showed you all one that I had from almost 40 years ago. And, and even when I touch this, you know, I know the, the energy that it carries because it was, you know, the love for those that felt less than and felt that no one cared about them. And, and, and they were, they were trying so hard to, you know, to hold on to life and, 
and then maybe life had left them, but their lives stayed with me, you know, so those are many of the people who have gone beyond and before, but I still hear their voices when we go to the halls of Congress and things like that. They are the ones that push me and say, go up there and go, go do it, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I didn't really create, you know, the red ribbons came out uh, uh, earlier from a, a community, uh, a quilting community, sort of like Common Threads, Mark Hopple. Uh, they really saw the red ribbons in, and created, but, but now I have the hair ribbons, you know, or the ear ribbons that I wear. And I see so many uh, women who use them and, and wear them and represent them well when they go out into the community because they open up an immediate conversation. You know, we as women, we wear our jewelry, we're, we're fashion. So people look at your face and they're the ears right there, the earrings right there on your, on your ears and right at your face. So it's a place where you can begin a conversation about um, HIV, about testing, education, and awareness. And really, it is about awareness, and it continues to be about awareness. We have to continue speaking and talking about it. And we have to let our families know, those who have families that are resistant to them, we have to know that love succumbs all of these other things. This is a medical condition, a health condition. It's not anything that you want um, someone who is already feeling bad from the diagnosis itself. You don't want to really kill the soul because you are discriminating or, or stigmatizing for somebody who just happens to get something um, that maybe you were lucky enough not to get. But health conditions come in all kinds of different um, letters and words. It's just which one did God place on us and how are we gonna work through it? Thank you. Um, someone just put in the chat that um, every time I hear everyone's story, it makes me stronger to fight for everyone and everything. So great, I want to cry. Um, just want to echo, like, listening to you talk about the ribbon and walking the halls of Congress and hearing people's voices. Um, I could just feel the love of what you were saying. So just want to um, honor both of you for the amount of, like, love that is clearly put into the work that you do. Um, we have two more questions uh, before, we, before we wrap. Um, and looking at, we can start with you. Um, what would you say to someone who is newly diagnosed and their loved ones still coming to grips with their reality? Hmm. Okay. Um, I wrote some things down with this. I just really said, you know, affirmations. And so I'm going to share a few affirmations before. But foremost, I said it before, manage your health because you matter. Manage your health. Learn educate yourself to don't stop educating go online find groups and organizations they're out there there are powerful women who just go to organizations just google just go on youtube you will find faces you will find faces who are out there to, to talk that are sharing their stories there wasn't any of those 40 years ago, not for women, but we're out there now. So look for them. And um, some of the affirmations are, I've survived. I matter. I live to tell the story of women who will not give up or give in. Mm. You are worthy of loving yourself and being. And then this is what I always tell, I tell the church much of this many times when I go to that community, I may not be cured, but I'm healed. I am healed. Mm. And celebrate life and dance. I love to dance. <laughs> it started with staying alive, I don't know. 
Mm. But what I would say is, what I would say even beyond that, come on, let's bring awareness before we have to talk to someone about a diagnosis. Let's talk about prevention and education and awareness. Let's do that because this, this health condition, yeah, I'm fatigued every day. This have, if, if you don't have to, don't, don't come, don't, if you don't have to, you don't have to, because as much as Pat and I talk about it, it's not an easy one. Um, your, it's a breakdown of your autoimmune system and your system. So prevention, first and foremost, talk about it, get educated, love yourself enough to love yourself and to love others. Love yourself, take care of yourself. But if you know life happens, like I said, there's, there's loads of diagnoses and diseases out there and there isn't hardly anyone that gets through life without something coming on them. That's how, how do you manage it, you know? So if you have come upon a diagnosis that you have to live with and you have to manage, well, then you first off have to begin to, to manage it. And you have to do the, and do the precautions that are going to continue for you to have some sort of quality of life. And, and that means going to the doctor. That means, and I'm not just gonna say take your medications because I told you now that I am working on a, on a cause right now because we need to, um, we, we have to have advancements in these medications. They're breaking our bodies down. So those things have to be um, researched. They have to be brought up. But medication takes you through. And so you have to become um, wise with that. And then you have to find support. Support in any way that you see that you want to do it. If it's your church, if it's you know, a group, if you find support groups, um, look for them. Um, like I said, it's, it's, been, it's been really a, a deep joy to have facilitated a group for five years with women and they are there and the, the numbers are growing at this point in time. So um, we're human, we like to talk, we like to touch, we like to associate and communicate with each other that is the makeup of being human that is just so funny that human is the first word in this diagnosis human immunodeficiency virus i mean we're deficient if we don't associate as humans so become a human become caring become um, understanding family 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 and friends it's no time um, there, I went to the health department for services and there are people that said, oh, you know, what if someone sees me at the health department? If I go, I'm like, well, if they see you and you see them, both of you all together, you know, like get together and start doing something with each other. Talk, bring something out. <laughs> that's what that's about. But there's no time for hatred. I mean, we as black people, we have been hated on we have been hated on. We as Black women, we are the most hated and disrespected. We're the ones that have to pull ourselves up out of this. We're the only ones that are going to do it. Education is most important. Education beyond the science and a medical diagnosis, but education so that we place ourselves in positions in this world so that we can make change. So um, I'll let Pat say something. I may come back with something else, but so I actually want to box. <laughs> I actually want to ask you a different question, Pat. Um, had a question come in, um, and it says, "What would you tell someone today who plans to get tested and is nervous about having a test done?" Well, I would tell them that it's better to know than not know, you know, because 
it's not a death sentence anymore. You can live a normal life. You know, you don't have to worry about transmitting it to your partner because there's you equals you. You can have a full life. Yes, you may be nervous, you know, and that's okay because that's a part of life. That's real, you know, really real. But I hope when you go get tested, whatever brought you to the place of being tested, that you think about changing your behaviors and protecting yourself and think about yourself first because it's your responsibility to protect you, you know, so that you can stay well and not contract HIV. But if you get tested and you find out, well, hey, you're still on top of the game because there's so much you can do to live a fulfilling life and support, like Lapina said, get you a good support network. And sometimes we have to build and make new families, you know, to help support us. And that's what I've done. But uh, go get tested because it's better to know than not know. Um, is there anything that you want to add to that, Lapina? What would you tell someone today who plans to get tested and is nervous about having a test done? Well, it's not those two weeks like I went through. And then that's that was really hard because we were being told, like I said, if you find out you're gonna die. No, those that's not the option these days. But I we mean, all got a status. I want to know, I mean, I want to know if I have high cholesterol, if I have thyroid, if I have um, kidney or liver disease, I want to know these things. So I go and I take tests and a test is a way that you know, hopefully your test is going to say that it's negative. And if it is, then you're one of those ones, the heart is going like this and you definitely jump and make those, uh, take those precautions. Um, just we, we talk about you equals you, but you equals you if your partner um, is taking their medications, um, there is a high you know, percentage that you cannot pass the virus on. That's with um, taking your medications with HIV, but there are still other transmittable uh, conditions that are out there. So you still have to think about, am I still going to use condoms? Um, am I going to use the female condom, whereas it's known now the um, inner condom? There are female condoms out there. I still don't know that there's everyone that's aware of that, mm. but they're out there to protect yourself. And you know, you wherever you are at in your intimacy, but, you, you know, as women, we, we have those ethers that are out there where we feel when something just isn't quite right or something is, so talk to people before, know sort of who you're, no, no, get those intuitions, but far most and first most foremost and most important is for you to love yourself enough to take all of the precautions to keep yourself well and healthy. You, you have to think twice and you, you have to think, you know, I know people look good and all of that and everything, but you got to be really, um, cautious about yourself. But if that happens, no, we have to test. I mean, uh, you know, we test for everything now. You had to, you know, take the, you know, for COVID, you know, and along comes another one. Seemingly we're living right now in a uh, period where many things are just going to keep coming and keep coming. So you got to be 100% um, on your health care for yourself. And if it should happen again, family, family and friends, uh, these days of you can't eat my, my off of my silverware, you can't touch me, you can't hug me. That's not the case. 
you know, that's not the case. I mean, maybe, you know, Never everybody was. that you see really, you know, you know, so you, you don't want to do any of those things. And like Pat said, family, some go through the bloodline and others go through who you meet along the way on your life's travels. So connect and stay with the people that you find um, value from and far and far most value yourself. Thank you so much for those. We're gonna wrap up um, before we hand it back to Destiny. Um, and did wanna note for our media strategist that there's um, someone that's having some difficulty with the survey. So hopefully we can get that worked out, but if we don't, we will email that to everyone to make sure um, everyone has had a, a chance to fill it out. Um, and just to give a, a brief pin, uh, the survey will ask, how you found out about this, um, how effective it was, what kind of information was useful to you. That information helps Seeds of Healing to plan for future panels. It also helps us to communicate the work that we do to people who are seeking resources and support from. So um, it's incredibly valuable for that information to come. Um, the last question that I wanna ask you both, uh, for people who are wanting to follow your work, how do people um, find you? How do they follow you? um pat we can start with you well um i'm on facebook as pat kelly i don't go there often but our organization also has a facebook page and it's called a family affair living our best life um we have a website a family affair living our best life .com. and um uh yeah just well i don't mind uh sharing my personal information, you know, if you come to me on Facebook, I would do that in Messenger. And, you know, many days, it's just, you need to connect, you know, so if you feel you want to connect with me, and I have some resources I can share with you, or just have a moment of talking, I don't mind. I'm here, I'm available. And if something is going on, and I'm not available, I'll make myself available. You know, because I know what the need is and how important it is. And before we leave, there are two women I want to shout out. Um, and one is Janet Kitchen for the great work that she's doing in Florida as a Black woman, um, making things available for other Black people living with HIV. Because like I said, we got to do it for ourselves. And then Monica Johnson in Louisiana, who was the first one way, way back you know, the things that she does for her community. Wow, you know, it is, I've been to one of their retreats and it was phenomenal to my heart. You know what I mean? To see someone being able to lift the person up, you know, and we just got to remember to love on one another and do what we have to do because you can Google me, you know, I'm around in all different arenas and different things. so. Please, 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 if I can help you in any way, just let me know. But though this, I don't have no money to give nobody. I don't make no loans. <laughs> Thank you. Christina, <laughs> how can folks find you? Yes, you can find me on social media, on Facebook. Uh, my email is ask underscore LPR at MSN.com because I'm serious. I'm ready to start that petition to um, science and medical um, community about um medications and how they're causing some of these symptoms and so i need your help with this because we want to get it we want to get it into those um arenas that need to hear this i i have heard i have heard i have heard from people that they are feeling the same symptoms and going through the same things we have to let them know and um you you can find me on many you can find me on a family affair. I'm sure I have something there, Common Threads, Positively, Positive Women's Network. Um, many, many of those um, arenas you will find information about me. And of course you just Google, but reach out. That's, that's, uh, that's what we wanna do. And remember life happens and you can choose the way you manage it, or you manage it from each day, each week, each year and you can make a difference in this world and make every, every day count. Because for more. 40 years, 
I, that's what Pat and I have felt. I know it. I know it. One day at a time. And here we've made another one today. So, yes. Amen. And I want to do one more shout out. And that would be to the common threaders. I'm on my way to the International AIDS Conference right now to go to the marketplace. And a part of common threads is entrepreneurship. And we learn how to make things and go to different conferences and sell it to um, imp add to our supplemental income that we receive. And so that shout out would go to Vanessa Johnson, who is the founder of Common Threads and who is preparing to do Common Threads in the South. And so, you know, y'all need to look out for that announcement and um, Common Threads changed my life, you know. It changed my life completely because it let me know that I was vulnerable to HIV before I actually contracted it. And that helped my mindset to know it wasn't my fault, you know, and it helped change a whole lot of things in my life. Thank you so much. We'll encourage all the, um, the viewers and people who will be watching from YouTube to reach out to you all. Again, if you haven't had a chance to fill out the survey, we please ask you, we encourage you to do that. That helps us tremendously. Um, thank you for letting me have this conversation with you, uh, Lapina and Pat. I really appreciate being able to be here and I will pass it over to Destiny. Thank you, Pat, Lapina and Ashley for sharing your story, being open and vulnerable and for your dedication. And thank you everyone for attending this webinar this evening. We encourage everyone to sign up for SoTime and follow us on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn for updates on upcoming webinars and join our mailing list for future updates. Thank you so much again and have a nice evening, everyone.